Hello and welcome. My name's Karen O'Connor and this is Things That Make You Go Hmm. This is your podcast to help you make the most of the wisdom and experience that comes with getting that little bit older. Let's get right into it. Hello and welcome. Today I'm here with Dr. Marnie Lishman. Welcome, Marnie. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm actually really excited again to talk to you. You're a psychologist, a health and community psychologist. You're an author, a well-being and mindset coach. You're a keynote speaker, a media commentator, and you're also Channel 9 Perth's resident psychologist as well. Yes, yes. I can do but you. that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> That really intrigued me about your website and what you do is you Mm -hmm. specialize in a specialized, I don't know whether that's the right word, in adaptability. Yes, yes. Well, I think I, I think a lot of psychologists, people come to us, don't they, because something is going on for them. It might be something in their life that's happening to them or they're just ready to do a little bit of changing in the, in the way they're thinking or they're not happy with the way they're feeling. So often I think innately adaptability comes into that. But I think in the last few years um, I've spent a lot more time giving people the formula to be adaptable because there's been so much disruption in the world. So I think, yeah, that's my special kind of um, little niche that I've been um, spending more time with than probably I've ever been. Yeah, over the last three years in particular because we've been required to be massively adaptable and a lot of people have really either become upset about it or dug their heels in and just gone, no, I don't want to do, that's my version of it. (laughs) No, I don't want to do this. Is that a normal reaction? And why do we have that reaction? Yeah, because it's change, isn't it? I think um, a lot of us, uh, whenever change is imposed on us, and I think it was safe to say that none of us wanted the pandemic to happen. (laughs) So uh, especially in the first few, if you can remember back to, I think it was like March 2020 or February, and there was like rumblings around the world. I think there was trickles happening in the the year before, wasn't there? We were watching on the news this this virus. And as it came closer and we were seeing um, numbers go up, then I think a lot of imposed change was coming from the government and then filtered through to our workplaces. And then we had to change a lot uh, with what was happening in our own homes and our own routines. And I think people, their psyche was so affected by that. And like you said, people either um, kind of was just like resistant completely. And we know that mental health and wellbeing was massively impacted because if change isn't our idea and we can't predict what's going to happen as a result of the change, we can't almost reconcile it in our head. And I don't think it's many of us that are very good at going with the flow and trusting the process. A lot of people had a really, really tough time going through that and they're still recovering I think still recovering now from all the disruption very much so I completely agree with that it's I don't know I'm the kind of person I've got ADHD vibes I reckon because I'm like oh been in this house two years time to move you know (laughs) I'm that kind of person yes and I think people like me adapted much more easily because we do self-impose change fairly regularly just because whatever. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so I think people are quite naturally psychologically flexible and adaptable. Other people uh, just need a little bit of time to get used to it because often we don't realise that we're stronger than we think until after the fact. <laughs> um, and so it's quite panicky initially until you realise that you can actually do it. But yeah, so I think everyone's quite different. But I think we're probably wired as human beings for change to take time and us to be in control of it almost. Whereas, yeah, when you get that mixed bag of, and this happens a lot in, in, in just in, moder- in the modern world, is that a lot of us are already chronically stressed. If we don't have control over the change, if it's not our idea, we panic. Yeah, and I think, yeah, you throw in disconnection and you throw in um, lockdowns and you throw in um, being scared. I think that that formula has made a lot of people really unwell mentally uh, in the last few years because it's 
you know, like you said, like sometimes you're like, oh, I think I would like a change. Oh, I think I might do something different. There's an element of control you still have because you can predict what you're going to do is going to be better for you. So it's exciting, not scary. Mm -hmm. Whereas, uh, yeah, I think the whole last few years has been, you know, uh, lack of control, chronically stressed group of human beings that we are, scared, uncertain, you know, all of that and piled into that. So I think, yeah, change has been more of a, Blah, rather than a yay <laughs> for most people. Go of that because there are people who are still really impacted by yes. all that and really showing no signs of overcoming it anytime soon. How, what would yeah. be the trigger for even, and I don't know whether some people actually understand what's going on or whether, you know, when you've done something for so long and it yes. becomes so ingrained, you can't see that there's another way to well, be. Well, no, exactly. And we're just, we're habitual creatures, aren't we? So a lot of what we think or how we think and, the, and our, our behaviour is, I think it's like 80, 90% of what we do on a daily basis is like a habit. So, and that's also our thinking as well. So, and and the thing is, um, and our psychologists say uh, neurons that fire together wire together. So we, it's pretty much the wiring. So to for newness to happen, or for us to create the new, it really requires a lot of thought, doesn't it? Because the wiring often isn't there. So a lot of us don't have those rituals in place to actually uh, think about what we want next or think about the endless possibilities that could come from change like we just don't have the time we're very reactive human beings rather than being proactive so I think going forward and and this really probably even starts um, I mean I do this with adults is teaching them to think creatively about designing their life going forward and and how exciting that can be rather than doing the same thing day in day out I think it's something that we need to start teaching our kids and I think a lot of people are to be actualize their own ideas and, and do things differently and being innovative and and all of that because life's going to change at any point for all of us we all have to go through stuff that we didn't ask for so how do we make sure our mindset is psychologically flexible to to be able to deal with that and it's interesting because when we're in because we are habitual creatures our as we get older we the possibilities for us that we can see because we've built up all these habits over the years yes. seems to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Well, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, because the brain actually, if you don't use all the parts, well, most of us don't use all the parts of the brain, so I'll rewind a little bit because it's such an unknown organ, isn't it? Like it's so undiscovered of what capacity it has. But, yeah, our brain prunes itself. So if you're not, you know, it's use it or lose it, basically. So that's why I think as people get older, they end up having that those same routines and yet you ain't be messing with those routines. <laughs> Whereas as when we're younger, we're a little bit more open to new experiences. But, um, yeah, I think we have to make sure that we're constantly learning and, and keeping our minds open so that that brain doesn't prune away and then all you're going to do is the same thing every day and, and be really inconvenienced. Um, and also mentally uh, really struggle if someone tries to make you do something differently, right? Because then that's when you're not flexible and that's when you're not adaptable and then out, you, you will panic. Hmm. I mean, there's even a saying that goes with it, you can't teach old dogs new tricks. Well, you can. <laughs> <laughs> I just find that, well, honestly, I want to slap somebody when they say that <laughs> Stop, you, you're just limiting yourself. But sometimes people will use that as a really great excuse not to do anything. Well, I've been oh. doing it this way for 50 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you're going to be really left behind, I think, if you have a mentality like that. Yeah. So it's about openness, isn't it? Openness to new experiences. Um, uh, yeah, being, being adaptable and, and, and really. I guess almost observing the fear, the natural fear and the natural stress that comes and saying and, and having self-compassion for that because I think as human beings, when things happen too quickly, it is just wired into us to go into that fight or flight state. So being kind when you are like that and then 
almost having and in the kindness and the non-judgment of that space is then 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 you've got the capabilities to kind of step through it and go no no I'll be okay this is normal that I feel like this you know I, I have a right to be panic be panicked about this or I have a right to you know be grumpy about this change but hey let's let's think about what could happen what is the possibility here and try and step into that a little bit rather than being scared or angry about it. I think that, that's a, a really good point because we, and particularly more so recently, if we're feeling upset or angry mm. or scared or whatever, that's bad and wrong. It's wrong. We shouldn't be feeling like that. You know, we've got to aim for the happy feelings. We should be feeling good. And exactly. so there's a real judgment about oh. Our own emotions that come, and I wonder how much resistance to change comes from that. Oh, well, that that doesn't make me feel good. I feel happier doing this. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, this is the thing. And I think a lot of us have been trained to, or conditioned, I should say, because it kind of happens more informally than that, um, to only show our positive emotions. I mean, you just have to look at any traditional media or social media and it's all about buy my stuff and it will make you happy isn't it like every everything so it's all like happiness 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 but yet the negative emotions we're often shown to sorry I've got a dog in the background can you hear my dog yeah there you go she's showing a negative emotion because there's probably like a a, a postie or someone coming to the door <laughs> she's in touch with their emotions um <laughs> which is a good thing this is my point yeah I think we've been conditioned from a very early age to show the positive emotions happiness joy surprise that's okay to show but anything that we perceive as a negative we've kind of swept it under the rug but those negative emotions are extremely important because they're giving us valuable information aren't they about the context of our life and once we listen to those and process them and and show them in a socially acceptable manner, <laughs> then we can do something about why we're feeling like that, which is a powerful thing, isn't it? Like you're supposed to be angry and you're supposed to be sad and you're supposed to feel shame and you're supposed to feel regret and you're supposed to feel guilt and that's for a reason. It's good for you to feel that. And to me, I always use it as it, it, if I've reacted to something and it's been a reaction and it's not necessarily elicited a response that I'm particularly proud of, Yes. then it gives me the, you know, rather than just wallowing, this is what I've learned over the last few years, rather than just wallowing in the, oh, my God, I'm so terrible, that was shameful, yes. whatever. Yes. But okay, what? yeah, I feel crap about that. But what else can I do? How else could I respond in that situation? So it kind of gives me... And mm. nudge to go, okay, you didn't deal with that well. What else? Well, <laughs> well yeah, yeah, yeah. And reflecting on it. And I often say to people, um, I need, because it's not good bottling those negative emotions because you're not learning and they're just going to keep, you know, they'll come back and bite you on the bottom later on if you don't like be curious about them. So if you feel like you've like accidentally bitten the head off someone or that you're reflecting that you maybe weren't that nice to someone that day or something like that. That's really important to sit in that and like that feeling, like we know what the feeling is, don't we, um, in response to those emotions and sitting in it and going, well, why do I feel like that? What, what's that about? You know, how am I interpreting what's going on? Can I learn from that? Or if I'm stuck with the emotion, can I cognitively interpret what's going on differently and change the way I feel? So all emotions, every single one of them, extremely valid. And they're there for a reason. But once you have them, you've got to ask yourself, is that something I can do something about? Obviously, when it's a positive emotion, you probably just want to keep it and you don't really need to reflect too much because it's like a nice emotion because it feels good. So that's often telling you to repeat repeat what you're doing. Um, but if it's a negative one, go, what, what kind of emotion is this? Can I do something about it? If I can't do something about it, can I interpret what's going on differently, like cognitively with my mind? Or can I do something to change the way I feel? So, for example, if you're really, really angry and there's nothing you can do about it now, um, you can't change it because you have a right to feel angry and you can't problem solve it, then going for a walk might shift that. Or, you know, spending time with your kids might shift that. Or talking to a lovely friend on the phone might shift that. 
So you can always do something with those emotions and then try and get back to a nice like homeostatic state and then get on with your day. All of them, important. How do you, just my brain went off on a little tangent here, which it tends to. (laughs) Where does boredom come into that? Because we were talking earlier about adaptability and people Mm. alluding to people being stuck in a rush, you know. Yes, yes. Over again. And when you're in that situation, you tend not to be present to what's actually going on. Mm. Where does that come into this? Well, boredom is an interesting one, isn't it? Because it's often we don't want to feel bored. But so this is the thing is that you've got to think of like, because I'm constantly talking to people, especially in this busy world, that they need more time just to be in the present moment and just be. Or do tasks that are undemanding but engaging because that's very good for our brain because it gives us a space to think. But boredom's another one because that's undemanding but you're not actually getting any sort of benefit. You know the difference? I don't know if you've ever meditated. Yeah. So meditation yeah. isn't boredom or walking out in nature is not boredom, is it? But boredom is about your partaking in something but you're not actually getting anything from it so that's important isn't it to kind of tell you this thing that you're doing you're gaining nothing from it (laughs) yeah I'm thinking about you know my little routine I have in the mornings you know with the emptying the dishwasher and feeding the cats and yes and those all those little household routines yes need to be done but they're really boring but then a lot of people stay in a job that yes. is boring and exactly and not necessarily there that they're not yeah. present to what's going yeah. on yeah 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 exactly so I, I think yeah listening to the boredom and going okay what's this about is it again can I do something about it so for example to your point you're saying say you're doing your your morning ritual with which involves cleaning then you can say is this something I could get someone else to do or is it just part of the thing and I'll get through it like it's analysing a little bit, isn't it? But, um, yeah, if it's in the workplace, that's really telling you something that maybe you need to be more challenged or you need a different type of job completely or you need to have a conversation with your boss to see if there's more opportunities, you know, So or maybe it's about you're not reaching your potential, you know, like just analyse it a little bit rather than keep feeling it and do nothing about it. And it's the easy thing in some ways to not do anything about it, isn't it? Because people stay in the same job. Well, they do, yeah, yeah, and rather complain about it for years than do anything about it. And that's the not problem solving because I think there's a, or it's, yeah, just denying their emotions. and, and, And I think especially in today's world, when we have negative emotions, it's very easy to push those negative emotions um under the rug, so to speak, and just uh, use non-helpful coping mechanisms for dealing with them, like all our addictive little vices that we have, whether it's going home and just drinking too much or just sitting and watching TV nonstop or scrolling around on our phone nonstop. So a lot of those addictive type behaviours, and I think all of us have something that we do that's not particularly, is often just dumbing or numbing down those emotions rather than feeling them and doing something about them. Where does grief come into all of this? So we've been talking about adaptability and then we moved Mm. on to negative emotion. Well, we didn't. It was kind of all in the same thing. But there are some things that happen and Mm -hmm. grief is one of them where there is no way you can avoid that emotion and you might not want to show it in public. Yes, yes. How... How do you get adaptable and comfortable and even sit with that? Because in our society, and I've been discussing this over the last few weeks with my guests, it's generally not acceptable to show grief. You show yes. grief in private. Um, well, exactly, exactly. And in Western culture, <laughs> it's, it's like that, isn't it? And it's not, it's, it's actually not good. Like in other, in lots of cultures around the world, Grief is, um, it's not celebrated, but it's acknowledged, isn't it? It's acknowledged and there's a lot of ceremonies around that and there's a lot of connection with others that actually help the grieving process. Whereas 
in a lot of Western cultures, yeah, there'll be loss. So we'll grieve a loss of something and it might be uh, someone passed away or grief, uh, we're grieving the loss of, it could be a job or, you know, something that we no longer have. To actually process that, we actually need time and we need to talk about it and, and acknowledge it. And, and that takes time, a different length of time for everyone. But a lot of us are trying to life hack it and um, almost feel it and then just move on and, and not sit in it. Uh, and that's not particularly helpful because then it stretches and because it, it stays in there. And it often will take longer to get through something because we'll store it away like a squirrel storing nuts and it'll crop up if we're triggered like five years down the track or ten years down the track. So we've got to hold space for that. Another, another weird term our psychologists use, we have to sit in the thickness of the pain of that emotion and eventually we will come out of it with learnings because grief gives us learnings, doesn't it, about our life going forward. It's interesting because I, I, I was just thinking, where does grief fall into this whole uh, spectrum of always head for your happy place? Do you, you mm. know, always, I can't remember what the term is, you know, but always go to what makes you feel right. Always mm. towards follow your bliss. Follow, follow your bliss. bliss. That's yeah. it. So, are you meaning in terms of trying to get through grief? Yeah, like, or, yeah. It, like if you've experienced something, your spouse has just died, or your yeah. pet's just died, or you know, something massive. Yeah, and you're all into follow. A, a good example. Here's a good example. Yes. A few years ago, a friend of ours had got divorced, and his wife was stopping him from seeing the kids. And mm-hmm. him and his second wife came round to our place, and his second wife was like, "Oh, it, look, it's all good. It's all good." I'm like. Well, it's actually not. Mm, mm. <laughs> not levels. It's not all good. Yeah. <laughs> and because there was no acknowledgement or it was glossing over yeah. the way our friend was feeling and the yes, way yes. possibly his kids were feeling and, and everything. It's sometimes not all good. Well, exactly, exactly. And I think, yeah, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think you can even entwine in all this, that facade a lot of us put up mm. quite naturally. Don't we? And that's why um, vulnerability, you know, people are talking so much about vulnerability in the last decade and how important that is. So I think we are moving now into, a, I think, human beings. I think we're coming off the back of lots of fakeness and inauthenticity on, on social media in particular in the last probably 20 years. But now we're moving into an era of what we want realness now. We want people to talk about their feelings and what they've gone through and we want to hear stories of adversity and we want people to say how they feel because we all have that. So I think we want we don't want a facade anymore because uh, we're, really that, we're realising that that's not healthy for any of us and, um, yeah, we're comparing ourselves with people on social media that are, are showing a perfect life when we know that we're quite imperfect. So I think... Yeah, to to what you were saying is that what we want now is people showing all of their emotions. And when we don't show all of our emotions, it's it's actually not healthy in the long run at all. And it's not giving us a chance to do something about how we feel. And, you know, like I was saying before, all of the emotions are very important pieces of information about the context of our life and something that has happened. And we need to take the time to kind of play around with that and go, what is this feeling and why do I feel like that? And and then it helps us, informs us about what we want next in our journey in life. And if you don't give yourself time to do that, you're just going to brush over things. And we also know emotions are connected to our physical body. So you don't want to be storing those emotions, those, those negative emotions and not doing anything about them. You don't want to be storing them away and getting an ulcer <laughs> or, or something else. We don't like sitting in in negative emotions. No, I can't no. Think of another terminology for them, but the ones we perceive as being negative, and that's not a judgment. You know, the sadness, grief, unhappiness, anger, exactly. resentment. Don't like sitting in them. So we'll go. Yeah, exactly. Away and just move exactly. on. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. And, and people have have always done that, haven't they? But it stays with you. So their may emotions are made to feel. Notice something in your environment, feel them, and then, like I said to you before, you either do something about it if you can. So some things we can do something about 
or you can um, interpret things going uh, in, in a different way to change the way you feel, or you could actually do things to shift how you feel. So, you know, like there's things where, say, say a partner has passed away, you've got to sit in the thickness of it, but there's still moments where you might want to do something to change how you feel. You know, like I said to you before, you might want to ring a friend and cheer yourself up a little bit, but you can't deprive yourself of the time to feel sad and cry and have those physiological reactions to your anger. It, it needs to come out. A bit like if you have a bad day at work and someone's driving you crazy, don't come home and be angry about it. Go and go and exercise it off or get a punching bag. You've got to release the <laughs> you've got to release it. Because otherwise it will store inside of you and it will come out in other ways, either to other people or, yeah, giving yourself a heart attack or something. Gosh, I hadn't even thought of it in those terms yet. Well, well that's the thing. We may, yeah, we've got a nervous system. So we've got the fight or flight response. So that will turn on. And if you don't do anything about it, then it will store up. Yeah, you just have to look at um you and your listeners. Look at Louise Hay. I don't know if you're familiar with her work about heal your body. It's all emotions that are stored actually affecting physical health. Yeah, our emotions are made to be felt and then processed and then out they go <laughs> and then we move on. Why do you think we avoid the processing bit, like as a society, not individually? Yeah, I, I think, well, you know, I'm not a... um be good to talk to an anthropologist almost about this but I think you know probably when we moved from you know from an evolutionary perspective moved more into groups into into packs over time is that there were certain emotions that were good to show the pack and some to keep away from the pack (laughs) you know like as our societies got bigger and became and we moved into kind of a modern world I think yeah we stopped being open about things because it wasn't helpful so it's all adaptive isn't it? everything we do is quite adaptive um, we do this for a reason because we know that in the society that we're in now we survive better if we keep things closer to us and not show everybody else so in that scenario how do you be adaptable I think what we all need to start doing is practicing it <laughs> Practicing it now, knowing that we will have to going forward because we live in a very fast-paced modern world where things happen really quickly. And I don't mean pandemics every five seconds. I mean, you know, look at how many times you have to update your phone. Like it feels like I have to update my phone (laughs) and I'm always behind in it. Like tech, tech, for example, is going so quick. You can't just shut down to that. We have to be open to it. Um, you know, the, the rules are changing all the time. Our workplaces expect different things very quickly. So the change happens so quickly now. So if we can all start now saying to ourselves, oh, what can I do to purposely practice changing things in my life and also almost uh, getting outside of our comfort zone a little bit on purpose because if you don't practice getting out of your comfort zone yourself, someone's going to push you out of it. And it's going to be scary. So it's almost like, uh, what can I do to get out of my comfort zone? What can I do that's a little bit scary? And then, and it could be just like learning a new language or trying rock climbing or learning an instrument or, you know, um, having a, a courageous conversation with my boss, you know, doing something that's a little bit scary so that you feel the fear. And instead of running away from it, you're sitting in it a little bit. And it's uncomfortable. So you're sitting in the negative emotions and practicing it so that you're almost desensitizing yourself for if it ever happens when it's it's not you in control as much. You so it's an almost a wrong word to use in pandemic times, but it's almost inoculating you <laughs> for future adversity that's going to give you negative emotions. So then you're more in flow when it happens in the future. What do you mean you personally mean by being in flow? It's a bit like the um, Bruce Lee quote, like be like water, my friend. <laughs> um, it is. It's, it's almost just you're kind of, um, and I'm using it in the term of just going with the flow, not as in the creativity flow, is that you're, you're not as resistant when change is imposed on you. 
So that's what adaptability is, is um, being able to, yeah, go with the ebb and flow of life rather than putting up roadblocks because of your own fears or of your lack of understanding of what's happening next is just being open and being flexible with whatever's asked of you and thinking through it rather than running away from it or avoiding it. I think I've just, it's just clicked with me. So what you're saying is practice making changes on yourself and in your own life so that when something happens like the pandemic, you don't respond. Yeah. It's like getting an an inoculation, isn't it? It's like getting the jab. And Well, it is. Yeah. Because you look at people at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, I think those people that probably weren't very adaptable, they panicked very quickly. They were, you know, stealing all the toilet rolls at the shopping centres. They were not acting at their best (laughs) so they were very irrational and I'm sure looking back at that now they were like probably should have not knocked people over at the shops to get trolley full of toilet paper but in in that heated moment they were frightened they were uncertain they didn't know what was happening and their brain went into that fight or flight state which would have made them you know, the, those negative emotions would have been full throttle. So, but their thinky brain obviously turned off a little bit for their own survival. So what I'm saying is, yeah, just practice doing things that are a little bit uncomfortable. You know, even things like trying a new recipe, you know, coming back to our, our brain pure um, pruning, you know, is, is practice doing things totally differently. Make your schedule a little bit different now and again. Do so, eat at a different restaurant, drive to work using different roads like (laughs) hard one isn't it because you just go on autopilot well exactly but that's a lot of us isn't it every day we do the same thing so it is practicing and having strange conversations with people that you wouldn't normally have is you're practicing feeling a little bit uncomfortable uh, so that when uncomfortableness that's not even a word comes to you then you're open you're okay and you will, because you've felt that feeling before and have known that you can actually get through it, you won't actually panic as much. Why? Because some people have definitely stayed in that fight or flight mindset. They're still yes. in it now from the start of the pandemic. Why do, and, and it's in a lot of areas of life, you know, it, mm. that's just the obvious example that we can date certain people like, oh, my God, they weren't weird at that point. Yes. <laughs> Why are they still <laughs> Why do they stay in that kind of scenario where they're still angry and afraid and upset yeah. about everything all the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is what fear does to us. They can really be quite life halting, can't it? Yeah. And some people live their whole life like that. But um, there's even a word at the moment, the, the term languishing. So uh, um, an organisational psychologist, um, Adam Grant, has been talking about how languishing is the, the dominant emotion of the last couple of years is that a lot of people have been feeling just almost like, Ugh. you know, that whatever's feeling where all of the negative emotions have just built up. They've just been in an automated mode. They haven't been doing all the things that they know that make them feel better. And he warned, he said, we need to really be careful of people who are languishing because they're just almost, yeah, just getting up and doing the same thing every day, but just holding on and they haven't processed everything that's been happening. And we've really got to be careful. And that's a lot of us that we start looking after ourselves and and almost going within a little bit and trying to find meaning from for us in terms of what's been happening for all of us because I think a lot of people have just been too busy to reflect on how they've been feeling in the last few years so it's, it's often that deep inner work that needs to happen if you're feeling like that and you can't shift it it's time to get some support so that you can unpack everything that you've been feeling and why you've been feeling like that again to learn from those emotions so that you can start applying it and designing your life forward we've only got one chance haven't we we've only got one life but we do, a lot of people do live their lives sitting in the stagnancy of negative emotions and not doing anything with them. So we've got to un- unclog it, which is my job a lot of the time. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking here as well of, for example, Queen Victoria, who never recovered from Albert's death. 
She wore uh, black for the rest of her life. She was in mourning for the rest yes, of her life. Yes. But somebody not moving on. Now, it's okay for us to point a finger at that person and say, you really need to get on with your life. Mm. How do you actually have that conversation with a person to say, what is it you're feeling? Why are you behaving like this or not even? I mean, how do you start that conversation? There isn't a right way mm. to start that conversation. I can think oh, of that. Yeah. I don't know who was chatting to Queen Victoria at the time, but... I know, but I think a lot of us are at that where we're grieving the loss of someone that we loved. And this is the thing, it depends what our culture's doing. It, is it allowing us to? And I think it would be safe to say that even what we witnessed in the last few months with the royal family, they had to kind of get on with some of the grief, didn't they? They had to kind of push it aside and get on with the protocols, yeah, without the actual suffering. Mm. So I think, um, yeah, we've really got to think about having just sitting with people and, and it comes down, I think, a lot to empathy, you know, the empathy to sit with someone, notice how they're feeling and notice the grief and sit next to them and say, yeah, I'm, I'm here by your side. I, I can see what you're feeling like. Do you want to talk about it? You don't have to say the right thing. You can just sit with people in the thickness of how they're feeling and just validate it. And often that will open up a conversation for people. Rather than judging them, which is what I like to do. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, but I think we I think we all do that, don't we, quite naturally, is like you think, oh, you should be getting over this or you should be doing that. But for whatever reason, people don't. So it's not until they start talking about it and getting it out and validating their own emotions and finding meaning in what's happened. And it will never be on our timeline. It'll be on theirs. So that's why, yeah, I think just opening up the conversation, allowing them to talk and, and through talking and being vulnerable themselves, they will often find the answer that they need, but that needs to come from them. Um, I forgot where I was going to go. I had another. I had another question lined up, and it's just flown away. So, oh, that was the other place I was going to go. One of the going back to grief as well. I know this isn't necessarily your area of expertise, but going back to grief, we are very judgmental of. We don't accept that grief isn't just about somebody dying. You you actually said it yourself. It might be grief over the loss of a job or grief over you had a big car crash and there's all sorts of different griefs that we don't necessarily acknowledge and how yes. much do they hold us back because if it, they're not acknowledged even by ourselves as being grief yes yes it's gonna just is it gonna anchor us there and stop us it's gonna stay there you know I really believe it does you know like I was saying it's really important for us to feel an emotion because that's telling us something and then we've got to do something about it you know otherwise it will stay and you know when you hear people in nowadays they talk about the word triggered I'm triggered triggered yeah triggered yeah he triggers me or you know someone will pass away and they're, then they're triggered and it and triggered actually means you're feeling an emotion right now in response to something that's happening that is triggering emotions that have been locked away from the past and then bonus is that it's brought right to the present moment, right? So not only are you feeling the thing that you're feeling now but it's bringing back all the emotions that you still haven't processed from a very long time ago, yeah, because new wounds trigger old wounds and if you haven't cleaned that old wound properly, it's all going to come right now. Yeah. So, yeah, grief from a long time ago can be from 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. It can all come back if it wasn't processed. So, and, that, and that's for a lot of us because particularly when we're younger, depending on what kind of household we grew up, a lot of us kids, we didn't process a lot of what went on. We just get on with it. And depending on what our parents and how they treated us in terms of allowing all emotions or you know, so I think a lot of us were, you know, particularly, I guess, and I, a, a lot of men were taught not to cry. And, you know, a lot of us grew up, I know I, I grew up, you know, don't, don't be angry or don't be ridiculous, you know, like those sorts of things. So we learn very early to show some emotions and not others. So a lot of us didn't process if things happened that were quite 
big that elicited a, a negative emotion. A lot of us didn't process it. So a lot of us nowadays are triggered by things quite easily because we didn't get a chance to do that when we were young. I was just going to say that to you. Does the number of the more unprocessed emotions you have, the less adaptable you're going to be? Is that the impact or is that got nothing to do with it? Yeah, no, I think it's all I think it's all connected and it really depends on what our life experiences have been before. So um, our brain is amazing. So it it holds on to anything that elicited a, a heightened emotion, either really, really positive or really, really negative. It will always remember things. So if you've had experiences in the past where there's been lots of change and change hasn't gone well or, you know, all of that is going to um, come into play if change happens. Uh, But I think for the most part, a lot of us are wired to not like change, particularly if it's not our idea and we haven't got a, if our brain doesn't have a good storage of good memories as a result of change. So yeah, we're, we're complex creatures and I think everything that we've experienced has everything to do with how we're reacting at the time. But what this is why knowing thyself is so important, I think, as a human being. If you can know thyself, you can notice how you feel, analyse it a little bit and go, where does this come from? Is it because of what's happening now or is it because it's reminding me of things that have happened in the past? And using that information and then controlling what you do next. Yeah, so self-awareness, know thyself is the key, I think, to any journey so that when you do have to adapt, you can notice how you feel about something and be agile, go with the flow. Mm. I think it's about time to wrap it up. Is there anything else you wanted to say? I'll put all your the people, how people can get in touch with you and everything. That'll be yes, on the web yes. page. Everyone. Oh, wonderful. But is there anything else that you want to share with people? Oh, I think I've talked a lot today, haven't I? I can't think of it. the best time. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think I think we're all a work in progress. So I think, you know, we've been talking a lot about emotions today and I think, um, you know, we've had a bit of a giggle about different things. But I think we're, we're such complex creatures and we all go through highs and lows in life and I, and I think what we're aiming from this conversation is to kind of say to people, like, you, we're not immune to tough times and you know life is a mixed bag isn't it of good stuff and bad stuff and I think this conversation is going to help us deal with um the bad stuff a little bit better and knowing that even if you feel the worst emotions or the ones that you perceive as really negative is that just allow them to happen and utilize them as valuable information so that going forward you'll be able to um yeah navigate life and the ups and downs of it in a a more healthier way Fantastic. Thank you so much, Marnie. It's been very great. Yes, thank you. Thanks for the chat. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe so you're notified when a new episode is posted and rate and review this podcast and share it with your friends, please. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you're leaving with some great ideas that can make a difference in your everyday life. Until next time.